Judy is certainly known over the years to all of you as a distinguished foreign correspondent with the International Herald Tribune, the Financial Times, uh, uh, the Irish Times and The Economist. And she's currently the non-resident senior associate at Carnegie Europe and editor-in-chief of the Strategic Europe blog. And she's also the author of the book, The Merkel Phenomenon. And she's going to talk to us now about Angela Merkel's unfinished business. So um, this, this um, invitation is very timely. Um, the, it's timely for many reasons. Uh, Merkel faces a big party congress in December. And uh, already this is high politics involved here. Uh, this, the speculation has stopped about who, who will succeed her. The speculation has stopped whether or not she will run again. Um, the speculation hasn't stopped about her big competitor down in Bavaria, Horst Seehofer. We will talk about him later. He's quite an interesting phenomenon on how his, his power play going on in Germany. But essentially, I want to raise a lot of foreign policy and domestic issues. And I won't speak long because I, I would like to do a question and answer and feel free to, to raise any issues related to German politics, foreign policy, and especially transatlantic relations, and needless to say, Brexit. So um, Merkel's entree is very, very full. Um, the biggest one she has, if, if one can be, if there's anyone to compare, the, the major one still is the refugee crisis. Yes, the numbers are under, under control now because Merkel, rather than the EU, she actually told Donald Tusk to do it, and uh, Jean-Claude Juncker did the deal with Turkey. It's quite fragile, the deal with Turkey, and President Erdogan hasn't helped matters, given what he's doing to the judiciary, to the media, and it's creating quite a backlash in Germany. And so, and in Merkel's party, they want to win the next elections, so they need stability on the frontiers. So that means they want this deal to go through. At the same time, they have to have the integrity to defend European values of democracy. So it's, it's quite tough for Merkel to balance this. But so far, Erdogan is sticking to the deal. I think he's sticking to it because he does want something from the EU, despite his bravado and his relations with Iran, his relations with, um, with Putin now. They've suddenly got better for many reasons, may, uh, not, certainly not political, but certainly economic. But at the end of the day, despite all the problems in, in Europe, um, the attraction of the EU is still very, very strong. And I don't think we should forget this. It's perhaps off the, the front uh, burner, so to speak, at the moment, but it's out there. Secondly, Erdogan knows very well that Merkel is the most powerful leader in Europe. She carries great sway in the council, in the commission, that's another story, but um, you don't cross swords with Merkel and she's had to it hasn't been a very easy relationship but I think there's a, a mutual respect there and Turkey is delivering and the EU surprise surprise is delivering the money as well this money is not going to Erdogan and it's not going to his party it's going out to schools it's going out to hospitals it's going out to refugee centers it's going out to helping children it's really important that the European public sees this and that the Germans see it so there's fingers crossed on all, all sides that this will work. How, having said this, the refugee crisis is far from over. We have seen, and it's not really discussed in any way, Italy is now being inundated with more refugees, migrants more than refugees, actually, economic migrant, migrants coming up from Africa. Um, they're using Libya uh, as a conduit, and since there's no, no proper security apparatuses in Libya, they're finding their way up, crossing the Mediterranean again, and the problem is out there. A very interesting aspect of how Merkel is dealing with this issue of, of um, refugees now coming from Egypt, from, from Ghana, coming from Mali, coming from Niger. She went there. I mean, this is French territory. This is ex-colonial France. And Merkel, for the first time, did a, a, a I wouldn't call it a center, a Sahel trip. Um, six weeks ago, she went to Niger. Niger is important not just because of the climate change. It's having huge impact on migration flows. Um, and Niger is important for ura uranium. It's for the whole nuclear industry. It has to be very careful its relations with Iran on this, and indeed North Korea. It's it's a very fragile state, and it's, it's approaching a failing state, largely because of climate change and also because of the huge um, political vacuum left by the collapse of the Gaddafi regime. This caused enorm enormous enormous. Um, 
uh, Havoc, especially in Mali. She went to Mali as well. Very warmly welcomed there. Uh, Oland wasn't, uh, didn't get in half the welcome that, that Merkel got. And then she went on to Ethiopia, which was very tricky. Ethiopia is um, being financed very heavily by the Chinese now, uh, but it's an important country. It's the headquarters of the African Union and actually Merkel and uh, the EU is waking up to the fact that the African Union has to play a much bigger role. So it's the regionization of, 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 of power structures and influence and, and empowerment as well. And that's a very interesting aspect of, of how Germany is seeing this as well. Um, so um, just briefly, uh, one more point on the refugee crisis. Merkel is hoping by, that by the time of the um, March when the Bratislava Declaration is supposed to be fulfilled, that Europe may finally have a common asylum and refugee policy. Um, I'm not so sure it'll happen because of Hungary, because of Poland, because of the Central Europeans. Um, and Britain is still in the EU after all. Um, but um, she's going, she has to do something. I actually think it's possible, but we can discuss this later. I think it's possible. I don't, I don't think it's the ideal intellectual solution, but there will have to be some kind of flexible solidarity to deal with this. Otherwise, Europe will never pull together. I think there has to be a bit of give and take. And the reasons why the Central Europeans treat migrants and refugees as they do, it's <coughs> partly because of their past. It's partly because of a, a populist cult of the personality taking place, especially in Poland and Hungary. But we can touch on this later. Um, this is the, so that's, that's the first issue of the refugees. The second issue, and I think this is terribly worrying um, for, for, for the German economy, but also um, for, for Europe as a whole. The Eurozone is in very bad shape. And um, there's a strong school of opinion inside Germany that the European Central Bank's policies of practically ne negative growth, growth rates is actually going to hit a stone wall very, very early on. I'll give you an example. Leaving aside that uh, the German saver, and the Germans have, had, used to have a very high percentage of disposable income that they used to put into savings. They're not saving anymore. They, they can't. They, they, it, there's very little return. But the, the negative effect of this is that for health insurance, for instance, because pension funds and health insurance are not making any gains from interest rates, they are actually being forced to put up their premiums from next year. And this will have a, a knock-on effect on the public. There will be complaints. It will lead to inflation. Actually, some in Germany think that inflation is probably the, the right answer for this. This obsession with inflation by Germany may be... May, may actually be quite negative. But, there's a, but this is a big issue now, the, the, um, the weakness of the Eurozone. And as long as the economies of the Eurozone countries remain weak, populists, populists can make hay. I, I think populists, Eurosceptics, um, right-wing movements, it doesn't matter, left-wing movements, strong economies take the breath out of, these, uh, out of these movements. But at the moment, we don't see a turnaround, although I see Ireland is doing quite well recently with unemployment falling. Which is good news. We can go to this later. So, a Eurozone, Portugal is asking for a bit of a reprieve. The Greek crisis is far from over. Um, Spain, Spain seems to be doing okay. Rajoy, finally, he's prime minister after about how many, 200 days of Spain without a prime minister. But the Germans and the Northern European countries do still feel vindicated, despite the anti-German sentiments uh, in Greece, but less so in Spain and Portugal, which is interesting. That's the Eurozone issue that Merkel has really given over to Wolfgang Schäuble to look after. Um, the third issue is, is um, a, a very complicated one, uh, the relations with Russia on the one hand and the relations with the United States on the other. Um, the, very briefly, um, Merkel has made the decision that Putin is not going to go away in a hurry. Um, it doesn't mean to say she has to get on with him, but she needs him to implement the Minsk Accords. And the Minsk Accords are not working. They're not working because Russia will not withdraw to the borders of Ukraine. Uh, Russia will not allow the OSCE monitors to actually monitor the border. And if they're not allowed, which is in the Minsk Accord, by the way, and if they're not allowed to monitor the border, what stops weapons and other ammunition and military hardware coming through? But above all, it's the state of the Donbass region. 
And Merkel has tried to persuade the, the Ukrainians, listen, you'll have to hold elections there sooner or later. And the Ukrainians say, why should we? How can we if there's no uh, safety and security there? Um, I have to tell you that there are some Germans in the foreign ministry, but also in some of the, the research institutes that believe that the Donbass is lost and Ukraine should wash its hands of it. Um, but if you do that, then you, you actually legitimate um, uh, the, the inviolate, the, the, you legitimate what, uh, what Putin has done. It's a priesthood for other things, and they can't be seen to be doing this. Um, so Merkel um, is holding firm to the Minsk Accords and giving Putin uh, quite a hard time. And when he was in Berlin uh, two, three weeks ago, the first time for three or four years, uh, there was no red carpet treatment for him. She was very, very tough. Six hours of intense discussions on not only Ukraine, but Syria. An important point to remember about this foreign policy perception in Berlin. Um, part of the Social Democrats, who are coalition partners, as you know, want to do a quid pro quo. Um, lift the sanctions off Ukraine if Putin lifts the siege off Aleppo. I'm sorry, they're completely different issues. And if you mix them all up, you lose any kind of um, integrity and you lose any kind of leverage. You have to s keep focused on the Minsk Accord and don't conflate it with the, with the Syrian crisis. Secondly, um, Merkel now realizes that Putin will not deliver over uh, Syria. Um, he is not going to see regime change under the present conditions. Regime change will come eventually, but under Putin's terms. Maybe some kind of interim government, which will be very difficult to see after the, 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 the terrible suffering and, and dislocation and the radicalization and different groups. But he's not willing to ditch Assad yet. And in the meantime, uh, the fighting will continue and the EU will be completely helpless and Germany will continue to arm the Pesh Peshmerga as they now approach M Mosul. This was a big change for, for the German foreign policy. So this is the, the, the interplay between the, the Ukraine crisis and the Syrian crisis. And, uh, the, and then there's the issue of Merkel's own coalition dealing with Putin. Merkel has come to the belief that Ostpolitik, the Eastern policy of engagement with Russia, is over. Um, she has come to this belief that um, the Ostpolitik was supposed to deliver, that Russia, through Germany reaching out to it economically, politically, socially, culturally, Russia would become like us. It would get closer to the West. Despite all the modernization programs, uh, Steinmeier, the foreign minister, launched a huge one uh, in southern Russia in 2007 when he was foreign minister. This has gone nowhere. In fact, um, any kind of impulse of reform is, is now not on the agenda. It's a special elite, not of oligarchs anymore, of, of, it's a special elite of, of um, loyalists around Putin who seem to have little intention of actually uh, ceding power and more importantly, having little attention of doing anything with the economy. Econ economic reforms means eventually political liberalization. One other point um, about the, the, the failure of the Ost Ostpolitik. Um, in Germany, there is called the, the Russian Versteher, the, the Russian people, the, 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 those Germans who, 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 are, who support, how would I explain? The fellow traveler. Some of them are very nice, though. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but they believe, no, give Putin a chance. But the problem is that um, the, these very interesting people see uh, Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Georgia, Moldova, through the lens of Moscow. They're not seeing these countries now as genuine independent states. So they're, they're second-guessing how this would affect Russia. So their reflexes are immediately to see through the lens of Russia. And this Ostpolitik has a paralyzing effect in some ways. Merkel refuses to see this, and she's taken Ukraine in its own right. She's got problems with Georgia and potential member of NATO, but she, has, she didn't have to make that leap. She now sees these countries wanting to go their own way and choosing their own direction. So this feeds into a complicating factor, uh, and this is my last foreign policy issue before I touch the United States, and it's the Nord Stream pipeline. Um, the, no, the first pipeline, it's, this is a pipeline, a fantastic idea at the time. Ukraine was stealing our gas, highly corrupt. 
the whole infrastructure of the energy sector, sec sector in Ukraine was, was totally um, run by the oligarchs. Um, so in 2005, Putin came up with an idea with Schroeder, who was chancellor at the time, let's build a pipeline under the Baltic. The gas will come from just to the top north of Petersburg, wrap under the Baltic Sea, and you'll get your, your, your energy. So as soon as uh, Put um, Schroeder lost the election, he joined the Gazprom board, the subsidiary of the Nord Stream. Nord Stream, two, Nord Stream 1 has been built to huge opposition of the Baltics and Poland. Um, quite rightly so, and it's not just about transit fees, it's about energy security, it's about energy dependence, it's about di 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 diversification. Nord Stream 1 um, negates that. Nord Stream 2 is about to uh, get, the pipes are about to be rolled out in the Baltic Sea, and uh, the Poles are petitioning the EU and the Commission, and guess what, Schroeder has been appointed to that board as well, and Sigmar Gabriel said to Putin, don't worry about the European Commission. I can fix that. We don't need the Commission. Germany can deal with it. We can go our own way. Thank you very much. But I'm not so sure they will, actually. Um, I think the EU may take a very strong th stand if they believe that there will not be third-party access to the pipelines, essentially honouring the, the third energy package, which allows outsiders, uh, which allows essentially the, the pipelines, to access to the pipelines. Um, this has not. This has yet to be uh, played out. Um, there's an awful lot at stake, and the big question is: Will Merkel move? She has always said it was an economic, um, business um, project, which it's not. It's highly political. She has stuck to it so far. Um, it doesn't do her. Do her. It doesn't win her any friends in Eastern Europe. Um, but she holds the key, and the former chancellor. Schroeder holds the key, he keeps it, he keeps the German SPD on board to support Putin and Gazprom. Merkel holds the ultimate key to ending Nord Stream, and I wonder will she take that big risk. Um, if she takes the risk, she alienates the German companies, but it, she has to, I think she will be under pressure to make a decision. And the last issue on the foreign policy is the transatlantic agenda. And this is unbelievably complicated. Um, Merkel now is the, the interlocutor for Barack Obama. It's not Brussels, not, it's not any of the leaders in, in, in the EU institutions. It's not Hollande, it's not the Poles, it's not the Dutch, it's Merkel. Um, he phones her repeatedly, uh, regularly. He's on very, very good terms after a very shaky start uh, in, in Obama's first term. He um, He's delegated the Ukraine crisis to her. He's done very little to help her with the refugee crisis. He's lectured her on the Euro crisis, but um, leaving all the, the differences and the difficulties, um, she has delivered in many ways for him, and that's the stability of Europe. She's delivered on Ukraine. People aren't being killed. And in some ways, and more importantly, she's delivered on the sanctions, getting the, the EU sanctions in Russia. Whether you support them or not, she brought a very disunited 28 countries together with the sanctions on Russia. And Obama actually is very grateful on that. And just as he's about to leave, he's coming in 10 days' time to see Merkel. He's not going to Brussels, and he's not going to stop at NATO either. He said something about his views of NATO, but he's done enough NATO meetings, and I think he's, he sees uh, not particular value in them. So um, the Washington-Berlin axis is just so important. The big issue is... Whoever enters the White House in January, will that access continue? There's no point in speculating. Um, one thing is certain, that Merkel's role in Europe at the moment is quite indispensable, and she is the undisputed leader at the moment. And she's respected by, by the Americans, maybe not by Trump, who, by the way, took a long time to admit that he had German descent. He said he was Norwegian or Sweden, or Swedish or something, but he had to admit he was a, 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 a Deuter, and he's had to bite his tongue on this. So, which is rather interesting, his own hang-ups about have, having a migration background. Who hasn't in the United States? So, uh, and just a caveat about NATO. Um, during her first term, Merkel was um, more interested in uh, bringing unity back to NATO, which had been severely damaged after the NATO cri after the Iraq crisis, and actually uh, bringing the unity also to the EU. Um, then she really didn't care about it. She doesn't really care about defence. But she's changed a great deal over the past six or seven months, in fact, eight months, largely because of the refugee crisis. She has seen that EU 
has taken years to put Frontex on the borders. She has seen that the EU will not do a, a proper collective defence or even marginal defence uh, to protect the borders. So, so she rang up uh, Jens Stoltenberg in, uh, in NATO, and Stoltenberg, as the Secretary General, always wanted to put the refugee issue on the table, but the NAC, that's represented every Wednesday by the ambassadors, they didn't want to. It wasn't their niche. It was a political issue. It was civilian. No, no, no. And he was very frustrated. But a call from Athens and a call for Berlin, and a couple of days later, the, the ships were in the Aegean Sea, search and rescue, helping out, psychological, political. And uh, Merkel has seen the value of shape in this. Uh, parallel, we can discuss this later, the EU is beginning to think what kind of defence role it should have. Brexit is triggering this. We cannot underestimate the, the damage Brexit is doing, but the potential twist it may have on European foreign and security policy. Um, I will leave it at that. We have only one thing to look forward to, if you want to call it to look forward to. It's how we're going to, somebody called it commemorate, how we're going to celebrate the 60th anniversary of the Rome Treaty in March. So I think Merkel's something up her sleeve. Thank you very much. <laughs>